Well, good morning, everybody. Well, I'm glad to be back, glad to be healthy, both my wife and I. Um, what a blessing it is to be able to have fellowship with people face to face and in real time instead of being far, far away. So I'm grateful for that. Before we get started with today's message from the Word, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for all the work that you have done on our behalf by sending your son, Jesus. That he came and lived, taught, and died in our place. Lord, that you yourself would come down, funnel yourself into a human being to show us the way and then to give your life for us. We are so grateful. And Lord, as we open up your word today in the, in the book of Luke, I pray that your words would sink down into our souls and that you might mold us more into your image, that you might help us to be like you in every way. Lord, you know the burdens of our souls this morning as each one of us comes in from a certain place in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you might use today to help lift that those that need to be comforted, that you bring comfort. The ones that need strength and courage to do something you've called them to do, I pray that you'd give that to them. Lord, you know our needs. And Lord, your word is enough because it comes from you. And so I pray that you would minister to each one of our hearts, Lord, in a place where we have need. Be glorified here today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we are back in the book of Luke. We're going to pick it up from chapter 14, verses 15 to 35. Um, Jesus is going to tell us about the dinner of the disciples. If you remember previously, he was called to go to the house of a Pharisee and to eat. And so he said yes, because you always say yes when people invite you out to eat. And that's what Jesus did. <laughs> And this is actually the third time in the book of Luke that he's going to the house of a Pharisee, of course, not subscribing necessarily to the religious hypocrisy, but using it as an opportunity to be able to share the truth. Jesus goes. And as he goes, he begins to teach. So whenever he's going to these things, he's always sharing what's on his heart. If you remember two weeks ago, Jesus began at this Pharisee's house by talking about, but by healing a man actually who was there who had dropsy. A dropsy, we would, we would liken it unto elephantitis or something of that nature where the, the cells retain all of this fluid and it ends up in death, usually a heart attack or um, pneumonia in the lungs. So Jesus sees him and heals him and he's a plant. This guy was put there expressly to see if on the Sabbath Jesus would heal. And they figure, well, if he heals on the Sabbath, we're going to corner him. And then we've got something against him because they're always trying to make something against him. You know what that's like when you're just trying to find something against someone? Well, maybe you don't, and that's a good thing. But, you know, when you're just looking. We see here, and two weeks ago we went over this, 14 verse 1. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees that he ate bread on the Sabbath which they went for uh, like a, what we would call a Sunday meal. And they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering, even though they didn't ask any questions, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and he healed him and he let him go. And then he answered them saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox who has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. So immediately this meal that Jesus goes to ends up being a bit of entrapment. And they're trying to get some goods on Jesus so that they might persecute him. So he was lured into their house under the guise of a meal. And yet they had a guy there who was a plant to see if Jesus would exercise his power to heal this man, and he did, and that got them angry. Isn't that sick? Anyway, 
my mind rushes with thoughts. Like why our, our country has no problem putting to death an unborn baby, but don't you dare harm a tree. Anyway. So Jesus is being coerced to use his power for people. And Jesus explains to them and uses logic and says, think this out, guys. If you had an animal that fell in a ditch, you'd pull him out on a Sabbath. You don't really have a problem with the Sabbath and working on the Sabbath. And isn't, isn't this guy worth a whole lot more than a donkey or an animal? And Jesus's heart was for people. It, was, it wasn't about animals or any of that. It was for people. And these Pharisees and lawyers, they didn't care for people. They didn't like people unless they could use them. And we, if we're not careful, we can kind of get that mentality because that's the world's mentality, isn't it? And in verse 7, so he told them a parable to those who were invited. So everyone's sitting down at the meal, and Jesus is going to now tell them, tell them a story, a parable about those who were invited. And he noticed how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give this place to this man. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. That's the kid's table. You know, when everybody rushes into the room and they, they have to get the best seats and the best places. And then suddenly you're told to get up and move because you're sitting in someone else's seat. I don't know if you've ever gone to like a, a sporting event and been found sitting in someone else's seats because they're better than your seats. No, not you good people. Okay, but Jesus is bringing that up. If you, if you sit in a place that you haven't been assigned and you just take it, you might be asked to get up and take the walk of shame to the kids' table, because that's the only place that's left, in the lowest place, because nobody would take that seat. So if you want to avoid that, don't be in such a rush to get the most important places, the most comfortable chairs, the most prominent places. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place. You hear all that, guys? You hear that? You know how you come to church and you think you have an assigned seat Oh, 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 you're, you're in my seat, man. Oh, really? Does it have your name on it? Oh, but I always sit here. I can imagine why. It's very comfortable. Thank you very much. Or people think they can tell you that you're allowed to park on the street in front of their house. Or, you know, there are people that think they have rights to these things. Jesus says, sit in the lowest place. And when the one who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. In other words, here, come in a more respectable place. Here, I've got a nicer place for you. Then you will have glory in the presence of all those who sit at the table with you. And by the way, that's what they were seeking was glory. They wanted recognition. They wanted to be appreciated. They wanted respect. He says, if you really want that, sit in a low place and then you get respected in front of everybody instead of humiliated. Then you will have glory in the presence of all those who sit at the table with you. For whatever, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's a really good universal principle to remember, especially at a job interview, <laughs> where you're tempted to stretch the truth. And then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner, now Jesus is going to talk to the person who invited him over to eat, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. So Jesus says, your, your whole party list is shot because your motives are that you get the influential, important people who will be able to pay you back. You know, like your neighbor who just put in a built-in pool and you say, hey, you need to come to my house for dinner because you have a built-in pool and I want to go swimming this summer. You see, and that's the way people make their lists. It's about self-interest. It's about what I can get out of you. And they don't look at people as human beings that are to be sacrificed for. 
human beings are those things that are like things to be used. We tend to use people and we tend to love things when we should really love people and we use things. We tend to get that backwards. So when you give a dinner, when you're going to have a big thing, don't invite people that can pay you back. That's a really bad motive. He's not saying that you shouldn't invite, your, you, can't, you can't ever have dinner with your relatives. I mean, some of you might have that plan, but he's not saying that. He's saying your motives in, in making this list is about what you're going to get out of it, and you shouldn't do that. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Now, remember, he just healed a guy of dropsy, and then he let him go, and he left. He wasn't really an invited guest. He was there as a prop. But you should invite these people, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So if you can imagine, this premier teacher invites Jesus over for lunch, and there's a little plan to get him outed that he's not a Sabbath keeper. And he does all that. And then after he heals this guy and he sends him his way, he begins to say, hey, listen, the way you're having dinner today is completely wrong. You people who are fighting for the best seats, you got to cut that out. And oh yeah, your list seems to have all these important people and it seems like your motives are just do good to them because they'll be able to do good back to you. Wow, aren't you glad you invited Jesus over to eat? But you see, he's exposing all of their hypocrisy. These guys trying to set him up and Jesus stands up and says, listen, you got it all wrong. You don't know how to make a party list. You don't know who to invite. You don't, you don't have right motives in doing it. Everything that you're doing here is completely wrong. And if you're going to give a party, why don't you invite more people like this guy with drops yet? I'd, I'd have a whole lot more to do. That'd be great. We can get some things done. And so Jesus is in the middle of teaching all of that. I'm sure he's captivated the entire room. And he's saying some very difficult things, right? Well, we're going to move on from the story and move to the next section. Now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, and Jesus is laying into them pretty hard, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper. They just talk about food all the time. And he invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I've bought a piece of ground and I must go see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. And still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. It's an interesting similar list, isn't it? And the servant said, master... It is done as you had commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. And everybody went, ooh. ooh. Yeah, that sounds pretty harsh, right? <laughs> Well, let's pick it apart here. Verse 15. Now, when one of those sat at table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes when I teach a Bible study, I'll be on a particular track and teaching about something and somebody will just stand up and share. I have athlete's foot. <laughs> and you go... All right, getting back to our text, you know, it, 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 something just kind of came out of left field. And that's what this guy's doing. 
Jesus is laying into these guys about their false motives. And suddenly this guy pops up and says, oh, won't it be good when we all get to heaven and we're going to have that meal? Won't it be awesome? Since we're talking about food. It seems a bit of a stretch from what Jesus was talking about. But you can imagine it happening. You know, there's always somebody who stands up and wants to break the rhythm of what's happening because it's just a little heavy in here, you know, to break the, uh, to break the ice. You know, like when somebody says something very awkward or maybe offensive and you go, oh, look at the time. <laughs> you see, that's a transitionary period. That's, that's what you say because the tension is heavy and you don't necessarily want to get into it and you want to get out of it. And so you say, oh, look at the time. And have you ever done that? Oh, wait, I think I hear my wife thinking about me. I, I have to go. <laughs> it's one of those things you do to get out of the situation. And I think that's what's going on here, if it's not too much of a stretch for my sarcastic mind. So you can imagine they're all eating, and Jesus is laying into them about their motives and about, you know, just how rotten it all is. And they don't care about people. Uh, they are gathering people around them so that they'll get benefited by the people they invite. And it, they just have a, a really, really bad way. And this guy says, oh, won't it be awesome when we're in heaven and we're going to eat the, uh, of the bread that's in heaven? Well, I like bread. I could get on board with that. But it seemed like Jesus was kind of going somewhere, and he interrupted him. Now, he's talking about this feast that's going to be in heaven. By the way, did you know that there's this wonderful supper that Jesus has invited us to? It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation 19.9, it says this, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And so even all the way in the last book of the Bible, it's spoken of this feast that we're going to have when the Lord comes and takes us home. Either he's going to rapture us up and take us home, or we're going to die and go meet him. So either one, we're going we're gonna to have a meal, and I'm sure it's going to be a better meal than you've ever had anywhere. And so I look forward to that. So that's what this guy's talking about. But it doesn't seem like he's, you know, Jesus wasn't going there, but he did. It's kind of the break the tension. You know, so I can imagine him like, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if we all get to heaven and we can, we can have bread? No, oh, look at the time, you know. It just, there's always one person, it seems. But yeah, I'm good with bread. Bread is awesome. I think it's probably my favorite food group. Um, and, and Bill Zacker does an awesome bread, by the way, if you ever go over the house. Or anything made with bread, like pizza or, or anything, anything bread. I'm, I'm good. Um, it's like, yeah, okay. I, I drink to that. I can imagine a whole room like, oh, goodness, I'm so oh, glad somebody said something different than what Jesus is talking about and broke the tension. You know, oh, yeah, amen, amen, yeah, yeah. Wait till we get to heaven. It'll be awesome. We're going to have some good bread. It's like sticking your foot in your mouth. You know that saying, you stick your foot in your mouth? It's when you say something kind of out of place and you blurted something and, and now you feel like an idiot and everybody's looking at you. It happens to me every Sunday. So you can imagine... He goes, oh, won't it be good when we get to heaven? That bread's going to be awesome. Yeah, okay. Well, Jesus is going to pick up on this, and he's going to redirect. But I want to warn you, he's going to disclose this man's false confidence. Because this man is making this big attestation that he's going to be at that meal. And Jesus is going to ask him some questions to see if he's truly ready. Verse 16, and he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. So Jesus, since we're on the topic of food, and he's talking about this great supper, he's now going to tell a parable about a guy who invited a bunch of people over. Who do you think the guy in the story is? It's God. God is the one who invites us all into relationship with him. Isn't that true? He's the one who invites us to the big banquet, the big one. Now, you, you definitely don't want to miss that one. And so as he begins to teach, he's saying there was this certain man who gave a great supper and many were invited. And the servant went out at supper time. Now, see, you have to think back then, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have refrigerators. 
So they would announce, they would send out invitations, like you ladies are very fond of invitations, with the RSVP and the, the nice curly corners and the nice writing and things. You know, like whether it be a wedding or if it's a shower or if it's any of those things. You, ladies, you, it, okay, men, men, you know how we send out invitations. No, you ladies, you do this. It's a big deal, you know, and you, and you want to get the RSVP and, you know, and then there are people that don't ever send them back and you wonder if they're coming and then you have to pick up the phone and you have to call them and say, hey, 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 I sent you this thing, you know, like now if, it, if it's another lady, I would, you know, I, you probably lay into her, but if it's a guy, it's like, of course, guys are like that. They don't, what's this? Anyway, whatever. Okay. But what they would do is they would send out invitations, and this is a wedding banquet, and so it's going to be on this particular day. They don't give you a time, you see. And so what they would do is at the time it was ready, and the table was set, and the animal was butchered and cooked, and everything was ready. Then they would send out servants to go get everyone, say, okay, go get them. It's time. And they would say, okay, it's time. Now, all day you'd be sitting around wondering, I wonder if it'll be breakfast, lunch, or dinner but they don't tell you exactly when. So they send servants out to gather everybody and bring them back. So that's the kind of a situation that it is. And they all give excuses. So the servant sends out to go get people and they're like, oh, was that today? <laughs> Have you ever had, you've never had this happen? It happens to me, okay. I'm the only one that has this happen. It's like, oh, is it? I'm sorry, that guy coming to the church on Sunday night, is that this Sunday? I, 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 was, I don't know. I, I only read it, you know, 20 times and heard Carl announce it, you know, 16 times. Take responsibility and initiative for yourself. Stop blaming your circumstances on what you're able to change. These guys are all giving excuses. Now, there are good reasons like, oh, I'm sorry, they can't come because they died. That's a good reason. It's a really good reason. If you commit that you're going to be somewhere and you die, guess what? You're off the hook. Nobody's going to be mad at you. But short of that, you should let your yes be yes and your no be known. If you say you're going to be somewhere, you should be there, right? Yeah. Yep. Right, of course, you said emphatically. So this guy's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the guy with the, oh, we're going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he's like still jazzed. The first one to give an excuse said this to him. I have bought a piece of ground and I must go see it. I ask you to have me excused. Now, is that a valid excuse? You bought a piece of land without looking at it? Really? You know, I got a bridge you might be interested in. You bought a piece of property without looking at it? You're kidding me. And now you're going to go look at it now that you bought it? Who would do that? No one. That's good. You're all very wise. It's an excuse, you see, and you can see right through it. It's paper thin, right? It's like you call your boss and say, yeah, I'm sick. Well, you don't sound sick. Yeah, but I am. I'm, I'm terribly sick. I mean, right now I'm vomiting, and you just don't know that. So. I, have, I have this power of ventriloquism to speak and vomit at the same time. Same place. No, it's paper thin and you can see right through it. I bought a piece of property. I'm going to finally get a chance to go look at it and I have to do it on the day that I said I'd be with you. That's an excuse. Number two, another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Would you buy a car you never drove? Well, you wouldn't buy five yoke of oxen in hopes that they'll pull a plow and do some work without testing them first, right? Maybe, maybe they're lame, maybe they're old, maybe they can't do it, maybe they're overweight, maybe they're underweight, maybe they've got broken bones. There's all kinds of things that can happen. And you're telling me that you bought five yoke, of, that's 10 oxen, by the way, five yoke of oxen and you haven't tested them out? That's a pretty see-through excuse too, isn't it? Well, I'm... So I ask that you have me excused. The first two guys are kind of nice because they ask if you would grant me an excuse. And the third one says, 
Still, another said, I have married a wife and therefore cannot come. <laughs> Do you not see through this excuse? You, okay, you, bought, you got yourself a wife, so you can't come. Why not? <laughs> so you're married. Congratulations. Bring her with you. Oh, no, no, I'm married. I can't come. What, do I get strippers at this wedding? Or, like, what's going on? No, I can't come. I'm married. It's, it's lame. It's a lame excuse, right? Would you all agree with me? It's funny, because we read the Bible. It's like, yes, oh, yes, of course, the parable and the story. And, oh, I've got some land. Well, you, you, didn't, you didn't check this land out before. I got five yoke of oxen. You didn't take it for a ride before you bought them? And, it, well, I'm married, so I can't come. He doesn't say, please excuse me, just as I can't come. She won't let me. She's not giving me permission to go to a wedding banquet. Maybe we had an argument, you know, whatever. So I, I, I just think it's, it's lame, right? So like, what is this story that Jesus is telling? Why don't people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Why don't they commit their life to him? Because their stuff their possessions have a hold of them. Their stuff is too important. Or the projects, the work, the things, the activity of their lives are what takes a precedence in their life. And I have no room for Jesus in my life because I'm just way too busy. I mean, I have to get up. I'd have to get dressed. I'd have to go to church on a Sunday. I mean, who could do that? I'm too busy. It's just this see through of an excuse. And then the other one is I got married. <laughs> Which almost sounds like, wow, that's good. Your wife's a priority. That's important, right? It's important that your wife's a priority if you're married, right, men? You better agree, especially if she's sitting with you. Yes. <laughs> it almost sounds like a really good excuse, but not to go to the wedding banquet of the lamb. My goodness. I mean, I know what it's like to be under pressure and your wife not wanting you to do certain things. I understand. There was a time when fishing was very important to me. I don't do it anymore because my face begins to curve like this. No, I'm just kidding. My wife doesn't scream at me and curve my face like this poor guy. So the servant came and reported all of these feeble see-through excuses to his master. These, these guys are tied up with their possessions, you know, their property. They're tied up with their activity. They're tied up with their projects. And then there's people in their lives that are just more important so that they can't come. You know, those are three things that people get very, very attached to, and they're called idols when you worship those things instead of God. When your job is so important that you do anything they tell you to, even if it's immoral. Or the person that you're married to, you're willing to do anything, you know, that they tell you to just to keep the peace, even if it's immoral and it's wrong and it's codependent and it's all the other things, just to keep peace. Well, my family's more important. Well, I can't come to church, I can't come to Christ because my family, I mean, what would they say? These are things that people give as excuses for not coming to Christ. And they're all see-through. So this guy's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I can just see the guy. Excuses and preoccupation are simply a lack of desire. How many of you have things that you really want to do, but you just haven't gotten around to doing them? I want to see your hands. Okay, because I'm loading my gun. <laughs> No, no, no. Put your hand up. This. <laughs> Me too. Me too. I've got a whole list of things. You know why they're not done? Because you don't view them as being important enough to be done. When they're important enough to be done, you'll get it done. If I had a growth that it was out to here the size of a football, I would probably go to a doctor. But if I get a little pain, I'll shrug that off, move on. 
The reason that things don't get done is because they're not a priority and they're not that important to you. Ah, I really, I meant to do that thing. No, you didn't. You wished to do that thing, but you never planned to do that thing and therefore you're not going to do that thing. It's got to go from the wishing to the planning stage, right? Planning meaning I take my phone out and I say, I am allocating two hours to get this project done. Click. Now you've, you've budgeted time. Now it's going to happen. You know, I meant to call so-and-so. You know what I have to do? Pull out my phone and put it on a list because if I don't do that and if I don't schedule the time to do it, it won't get done. I cleaned my office today. You know why? Because it was a mess. So I had to take care of it. <laughs> but I had time. I scheduled it. I knew I was going to take care of it, so I took care of it. I've been sick for a while, so I've had time to think about all this. The reason things don't get done is because you don't really have a desire to do it. Plain and simple. So if you say, wow, you know, there's this important thing I didn't do. Well, you just don't want to do it. That's really what it is. Because if you wanted to do it, you'd do it. Then the master of the house, being angry, he was angry, said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the blind, uh, the lame and the blind. These are the same people that Jesus says he should have asked to his feast that he was having there, the lunch they were having. And the servant said, master, it is done as you've commanded and there's still room. And then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them that they should come into my house that it may be filled. For I say to you that none of these men who were invited shall taste my supper. So the master invites everybody. Everyone that got an invitation is making excuses willy-nilly left and right. The deeper meaning of this parable is Jesus is speaking to a room full of elitist religious people who are rejecting him, the very son of God. And he's saying, listen, boys, you're not going to make it to the table. You're not going to make it. As much as you think so, because you decorate yourselves all nice and you're all religious and you all have your little cliques and clans together, it doesn't mean you're going to make it. He's talking about the Jewish people. And not long after this, in 70 AD, the temple was completely destroyed. There is no more sacrifice going on. The ministry that was once in Jerusalem is done because they rejected him. Those are the ones who got invitations. Those are the ones who should have known that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Jewish Messiah who came. You know who the people are? Who are the, the lame and the King James says, halt. I like that. The poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Me, you, debilitated by sin in our lives, not even trying to put up a pretense to pretend we're something. And he says, go out and make sure that my house is full. Do you see the heart of God? The heart of God is that heaven will be full. It's not like, no. No, I'm sorry. You don't have ID. You're not getting in. You know, Jesus is going to sit there like the bouncer. Say, no, sorry, you can't get in there. You're not on the list. He wants his house to be filled. This is desire to have the house filled. So he says, go out into the byways. Go into the schools. Go into the street. Go into the bars. Go into wherever there are people who will listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ and bring them in. That's what it means. Go into the subway. Uh, you know, it's not for everybody. Make sure that you can handle people that are in the subway if you're going in the subway. There are, there are people doing unspeakable things there. These are people that will hear the gospel gladly. But, you know, you tell some people about Jesus, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know about Jesus. I know all about Jesus. Oh, do you? Is he the Lord of your life? Is he in control of everything you do, all of your thoughts, every action of your heart, everywhere you go? What are you talking about? Yeah, that's what it is to be a Christian. It's a follower of Christ. So I'm sure this man who stood up and said, oh, it'll be good to eat bread in the kingdom of God. 
I'm sure he's taken down a couple notches at this point because Jesus is telling him, you think you've got an invitation, but you're not going to be there. That's some very difficult truth to swallow, isn't it? Mark 12, 37 says that the common people heard him gladly. As he spoke to all of these religious elites, they got harder and harder and stronger against him as he went. But the common people heard him gladly because he was telling the truth and they heard the truth and they recognized it. And they weren't, it wasn't above them to say, yeah, I know I'm nothing, I'm, I'm a sinner. You know, that's the first step in approaching God is to realize that you're a sinner before you can accept his invitation. Our next section talks about discipleship. Jesus is now going to up the bar on these folks. In verse 25, now great multitudes went with him because Jesus attracted a lot of attention. And he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Of which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see begin to mock him, saying, this man, he began to build, he was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the others are still a great way off, he sends a delegation and he asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So as all of these crowds are following Jesus, he turns around and tells them this, which seems like, hey, you know, we want to be, we want to be your disciples, Jesus. And Jesus says, oh yeah? <laughs> and he lays down some truth. And it's hard to swallow. So he tells them all, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children. Any, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands if you hate <laughs> your father, your mother, your wife and your children. Jesus is saying, unless you prefer them beneath following me, then you can't be my disciple. You see, even your family has got to be second to me. And the word hate means to be not chosen. Like if you're going to play kickball and you pick this person and they're on your team, everyone else was hated doesn't mean that there's this deep animosity like you and I might use the word. It means that they were preferred less or they were not chosen. That's what it means in the original Greek. So unless you are willing to put all of those things under authority and if those things are not a lesser priority in your life, you can't be my disciple. Jesus is asking for everything, isn't he? It's not like a nice little label that I can wear and say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, it's nice. I'm glad you got the label. You might have a bumper sticker. You might have Christian songs. You know, you might wear a cross. And yet he says, unless you hate, in other words, prefer less, my, your father, your mother, your wife, and your children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life. In other words, I have to be second. I, I can't be the most important thing. I don't know about you, but I do a lot of things for me. Do you do a lot of things for you? Do, do you wash yourself? I bet you do. You feed yourself. All of us pretty well fed, me included. I buy clothes I like. I, I watch things on TV I like. I, you know, buy furniture I like. I listen to songs that I like. It's about me, me, me. And Jesus says you have to hate your own life too. You've got to be subservient to doing what God would have you do. He's talking about forsaking others. Unless 
they are a lesser priority. You cannot be my disciple. Verse 27, he lays down a second requirement. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's interesting. Uh, if we don't understand it, good thing we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which explain Matthew records this. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That seems to be very well explained. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is talking about sacrificing the preference of having the top priority in life. He wants that place. He wants that nice, righteous place in our lives. And very often we rush to sit in the, in the best seat and it's God who should be sitting in that seat, getting back to our previous meal. And he says, unless you take up your cross, notice he doesn't tell you to take up his cross because you couldn't handle his cross. His cross was for the sins of the world and none of us is qualified to carry his cross. But we have to carry our cross. And don't say that your mate is your cross. That's such a Christian thing. Your cross is you die. You sacrifice yourself. That's what the Lord wants us to do, is to give up all of the me-pleasing. It's not that you don't do anything nice for yourself. It's that you live for Christ. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's what the Scripture's teaching. And so taking up our cross and following him means there are certain things I can't do. There are certain people I don't spend time with. There are certain places I don't go. There are certain occupations I won't be part of. And that's just the way that it is. Why? Because that's what the Lord would have me do. I'm not going to cheat on my wife. Why is that? Because there's no one prettier? Well, that could be argued. But I don't do certain things because the Lord wouldn't have me do them. And I do certain things because the Lord would have me do them. You see, I'm no longer my own. I was bought with a price. Therefore, I'm going to honor God with my body. And so that's what it is to be a Christian. It means I follow Jesus. Not only do I put everything else under him in priority, but I take up my cross, which means I'm going to suffer and die every day in so many ways. You know what it is to be patient with someone? when they're blathering on and you're like, Jesus, you see me bleeding? You see me bleeding here? You do it not because they're, they're so interesting. You do it because the Lord would have you do it and you should show love to them and consideration to them and respect to them. Whether they deserve it or not, the Lord deserves our 100% obedience. So it's not giving to somebody who's worthy. It's giving to somebody because God's given us so much. Amen? Okay. It's the execution of self. Jesus is saying, pick up the cross. Now, there are people that actually literally do this. They, certain times of the year, in certain cultures, they take the cross and they drag it through. And, you know, that's all good because that's a once and done thing. I like that. And You're going to take up your cross today, right? Whatever it is that the Lord's called you to do. I mean, th there's certain things I can't do. I had to put down a whole bunch of stuff in my life, and I'm still working on it. I hope you guys understand what that means. To be a Christian means that you are sacrificed to yourself and you live your life for Christ. That's what we do. Verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation, he's not able to finish, and all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus tells the story of somebody who decides to build a tower. You don't build a tower without blueprints and a budget, right? You want to make a plan, and you want to count the cost. How much time, how much effort is it going to take me to build this thing? Because if you don't, you might get stuck, at, stuck in the middle of your project, and suddenly it doesn't get happening. It's not going to go all the way up. So Jesus tells about counting the cost, and it's interesting because there's, there's two ways to be able to look at this. I've always looked at it as before you come to Christ, before you become a disciple, count the cost. 
because it will cost you everything. But you know what? I'm not very good at doing that. Like when I got married, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I did not count the cost. Because how do you count the cost of something you've never experienced? When we had children, first we had one, then we had two. I knew better when we had the second one. You know, it costs a million dollars to raise a child now. That's the estimate. I didn't know this previously. I may have changed some of my behaviors. Jesus says, count the cost. If you're going to jump in, if you're going to follow Jesus, you want to be one of the multitude, you want to do that, make sure you think about what you're doing because it'll cost you your life. It'll cost you everything. But the interesting fact is Jesus uses a tower and he uses an army. He uses a tower. And the, the best example I know from the scriptures about a tower is the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel back in Genesis was this tower where the men got together. And well, I'll just read it to you because it's better to hear it from the word. In chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, it says this, The whole earth was of one language and one speech which you can get a lot done, by the way, if that's the deal. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. By the way, this is in Iraq currently. And uh, you can actually see this. I have a picture of it. And they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower in which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have all one language. This is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose will be withheld from them. Come, let us, let us, let us go down, go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from all over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel or Babel because there the Lord confused their language and all of the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Now, you and I might say, that seems like cruel and unusual punishment, Pastor Dave. These people just want to build a city, and God comes down and makes them all confused where they don't understand each other. And so suddenly, they're all speaking a different language, and they don't understand. And you might say, well, that's a crazy thought. Most linguists, uh, e even secular linguists, agree that all languages come from one. Even as geneticists realize that we all have common DNA regardless of your skin color or your height or characteristics. It's rather interesting how science is bearing out what the word of God says. God came down and confused their language. Think about languages. If you know more than one, you know, if you have a Latin based language, that's one thing. If you have, if you know Chinese, you're a genius as far as I'm concerned, especially if you can write it or Arabic. Some of these are pictorial languages like Hebrew is. It's a pictorial language. It's an amazing thing that we could figure all that out. But guess what? We didn't figure all that out. God came down and confused all their languages and they separated and developed. Why would God do that? Because this was an act of rebellion. If you go back to chapter nine, the Lord said, spread out guys, go to the uttermost ends of the world. What these guys said is, let's gather in one place. And you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, they're being disobedient to what God told them to do. And so for, in order for them to scatter, he came down and confused their languages. And you know what happened in the first century in Jerusalem? Persecution came down on the Christian church and suddenly Christians went everywhere. And the word of God went out all over the place because of persecution, same principle. This is outward rebellion because God said scatter and they said, let's gather. And they said, let's build a tower up to the heavens. Why the heavens? Well, 
Some people will speculate that it was to view the stars and be able to tell the future by the stars and that kind of thing, which is a plausible explanation. But it's an interesting thing. Notice they didn't use stone. They used brick, which is made by man. Notice what they used instead of mortar. They used asphalt. Why would you use asphalt for mortar? Because asphalt has tar in it, and basically what you're building is a structure that's watertight. Why would they build a structure that's watertight? Because they don't believe what God said. This is what God said in Genesis 8, 22, or 21 rather. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. They were waiting for another flood and they didn't believe God. So they make themselves a tower up to the heavens, which is gonna give them great authority and they make a name for themselves and we're gonna make it waterproof. So even if God brings judgment, we'll, we'll be safe. You see that? I think this is what Jesus means when he says, count the cost. If you're building a tower and you're gonna assemble something and I'm gonna liken it unto your life and you're gonna put all these things into your life and you're gonna make sure that, boy, you're judgment proof and you know I've got everything figured out. I've got enough money put aside. I've got bigger barns. You know, I've got all that. You're gonna do all that. You better count the cost because your life will end one day and you will stand before God and give an account for everything that you've done in this life. So count the cost. If you're going to build a tower, you need to know more about what's going to happen when you take your last breath. Because it might be everything that you built doesn't mean a thing. It might be that it's just an outward rebellion against God, and it's because you don't believe who Jesus is, who Jesus said he is. And so you build a tower to make a name for yourself. It's the American dream, isn't it? There's actually a picture. It's, uh, sorry, it's dimly lit and all, but that is actually in Iraq, and that is the remains of what is the Tower of Babel. And you can still see the black asphalt that's in between the stones that are there. It's a rather interesting thing. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting deal. In Psalm 27.1, it says this, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Amen. Unless the Lord is building your life, your life isn't worth building. Because it's all going to go away. Jesus then backing this up with another parable. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and he asks conditions of peace. Well, that makes a lot of sense. If I'm going to go to war with another king and that king's got 20,000 men and I've got 10,000 men, I'd better have a genius idea how I'm going to win because it doesn't look like I will. So while I'm trying to figure out what it is I'm going to do, I'm going to send a delegation of peace and make peace with this guy so he doesn't whoop my butt. Make sense? That's the Jersey version, but you get it, right? Isaiah 118 says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, which is what Jesus is doing here. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, which means white. So Jesus says, count the cost because you are the one with 10,000 men. God is the one with 20,000 men. Do you think you can go and fight up against God? Do you think with your phony baloney excuses that you're going to be able to prevail against God and not see judgment? Of course not. Listen, so what do you do? I want to send a peacemaker. I want to send somebody to work out the details of making peace. Jesus is that messenger. Jesus is the only one between man and God who takes away our sin. He's the only one. So instead of going to battle with God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wave the white flag and I'm going to send Jesus and say, Lord, I, I pray that you intercede for me because I need it. Because I'm going to get whooped 
that I deserve to get whooped, right? It says in Ephesians 2, 13 and 18, but now Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you once who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation, having established in his flesh the enmity, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the father. You see, Jesus is that emissary between God and us. He is our peace. He alone. If you haven't come to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your savior, you can do that today. And he will be the one who makes peace between you and God not because you deserve it or because you're going to turn over a new leaf and the promise of a new life, but because he wants to give that to you and change you from the inside. And that's what it is to be born again. Amen? Amen. And so likewise, like the tower and like the army, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. It's, either, it's, it's interesting, that word forsake means to say goodbye. It's like a sorrowful goodbye. I remember the day I sold my motorcycle. It's like, <laughs> bye. I remember I sold my Lincoln Navigator. Bye. You know, there are things that we let go. There are things that come into our life and things that go away. It's a little like jumping out of a plane. And you say goodbye to a perfectly good plane <laughs> and catapult yourself to the ground at high rates of speed, hoping that the little string that you pull will save your life. That's what it is to be a Christian. It means you let everything go. It means you wave goodbye to all safety, all security, anything about you keeping yourself together and you just let it go. Uh, I know you want to sing the song, but we're not going to do it. <laughs> and you throw it on a fire and you let it all go. It doesn't mean that I don't own anything. It just means that the stuff that I own doesn't own me. And it's kept in proper priority. And it doesn't matter whether you have a lot or you have a little. I've seen homeless people that are the greediest, selfish people in the whole world. And I know rich people who are more generous than I could ever be. It's not about how much you have. It's about whether the stuff that you have has you. And whether it's held in priority. Matthew 16 verses 25 and 26 says, what, Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Whatever tower it is that we might think we're building, whatever sort of warfare that we think we're involved in, is it worth your soul? Is it worth your eternal life? Counting the cost knows that I can't pay the debt that I have accrued between me and God because of my sins. But Jesus freely says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Thank God for Jesus. Because without which I would be a lost, I'd probably be a dead man at this point. And I imagine and I hope it is the same testimony for all of you that Jesus has saved you from your sins and saved you for heaven and given you a hope. Amen. Amen.